Well, I wrote the Nepal Chronicle so that anyone could read it. A lot of hiking books um, that I've read in the past, what that tells you is uh, the length of the, of the trail and um, the conditions of the trail and how far you need to go and where to stop and where to go and that is really boring to me. Um, and I didn't, want to I didn't want to write the book that I didn't like to read. So one of the things that I wanted to do was put together a book that actually, um, if you're planning on going to Nepal, if you're not planning on going to Nepal, if you've already been there, um, if you have no intention of going there, which and most people probably won't, um, you still might want to read the book. And in order to do that, what I had to do is focus not just on the trail, and not just on the miles, and not just on the conditions of the trail and the elevation, but I had to focus on the people. So I hope that if you're a hiker, you'll enjoy the book because I do give the mileage and I do talk about the trails. But if you're a non-hiker, or if you're an armchair traveler, or if you love the Travel Channel, or uh, you read Peter Mathiasen, or Bill Bryson, or those guys, um, you'll still get the same pleasure out of the book because my intent was to simply put you in the place and give you some background of, of the Himalayas and of the culture and of the people who live there. I got interested in hiking in the first place in a kind of a strange way. I, um, I'm originally from Buffalo and there's not a lot of uh, mountains in western New York. So when I first came to New Hampshire I was working for uh, the Union Leader and I was looking for stories. I was living in Londonderry at the time and I knew no one and I had no friends. And I heard about this guy who was climbing Mount McKinley uh, up in Denali National Park. His name was Jim Gagney. And I knew nothing about Mount McKinley, Mount McKinley or climbing or any of that type of stuff. And um, so I called him up because I thought it was a good story. And we talked for a while. I did the story. And he went off to Alaska. And he said, uh, you know, when I come back, you know, if you're looking for something to do, um, you know, I'll... I'll take you for a hike. We'll go up into the White Mountains and we'll, we'll do some hiking together. And I said yes, not because I knew anything about hiking, but because I didn't know anyone. And he was making an offer for something to do, or something to do. And I'd never been to the White Mountains. I didn't even know what the White Mountains were. So he finally came back and he said, hey, let's go for a hike. And I said, great. And he said, have you ever heard of the old man on the mountain? And I said, who's that? Because I had no idea what the old man on the mountain was. And he said, well, we're going to climb up it. So my very first hike, 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 not just in the White Mountains, but ever, was going up the caretaker's route of the Old Man and Mountain. This was before 2003 when the Old Man fell down. So the caretaker's route is a hand over overhead climb up with cables and bars on the side of the rock. And uh, halfway up, I puked because it was such a huge effort for me and I felt really sick and I thought I was going to die. And uh, But when we finally got to the top, um, I stepped out on what was the old man's forehead and looked down right down the gully of Franconia Notch and uh, I, I knew that was going to be the rest of my life um, because it was so amazing and just the accomplishment of doing it so that's that was the start of it for me and it's been going ever since for 15 years. I do have uh, quite a bit of other hiking experience um, some with my wife some on my own. There are 48 mountains in New Hampshire that are over 4,000 feet tall. And the AMC has um, a club, which is called the 4,000 Footers Club. If you hike all of the 4,000 footers, you get to join this club. And my wife and I both are members. I actually through hiked uh, the Coast to Coast Trail. Um, it's called the Wainwright Trail in England. That's 192 miles from one side to the other. And um, Mina and I spent a few days in the Grand Canyon, um, at the hiking in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So we've, together we've scaled uh, about a dozen of the high points in the United States, um, including Humphreys Peak and um, most of the Appalachian Trail in New Hampshire. So uh, when, we, when it came time for us to go to Nepal, we had already quite a bit of experience under our belts, which is one of the reasons why we decided um, to hike to Mount Everest Base Camp uh, unguided and unportered. What that means is that we didn't hire a commercial trekking group to lead us to base camp and we didn't hire a Sherpa or a porter to carry our gear. We carried our own gear and we spent a lot of time researching the trek and the trail itself so that we could find our own way. We're very familiar, Mina and I, with the White Mountains and the White Mountain trails are notoriously steep and rooty and rocky. They're very difficult trails. They're not high but they're very difficult. So we did a lot of training in the White Mountains um, just to build our strength up. But the important thing was the altitude. The difficult part of the Himalayas is not the trails themselves. The trails are like super highways and they're very 
shallow, they're very clean and they're very not rooty and rocky. Um, but they're high. You know, when you fly into Lukla, you fly into all about 9,000 feet, which is you're already 3,000 feet higher than anything in New England. So we did a lot of cardio training in the year leading up to it. Uh, we did a lot of races. We did a lot of running to build our lung capacity. And we also gave ourselves a lot of time. If we were with a commercial trekking group, uh, a commercial trekking group typically averages nine days, maybe 10 days. You have to go in and to go out. We gave ourselves 17 days. So we were actually able, because we were able to take our time and because we had trained in cardio a great deal for the year prior to the event, uh, we were able to actually train pretty well. So while there are risks, um, I mean there's risks involved in any sort of hiking um, that are the obvious ones like spraining an ankle or um, falling and hurting yourself. At, in, at altitude in the Himalayas, the main risk um, is acute mountain sickness which is uh, oxygen deprivation to your brain. And that comes at you um, sometimes without warning. It often starts with this little pinprick in the back of your head. And off, usually a few deep breaths and slowing down would make that go away and, and we would be fine. So that was, that was always a danger. Otherwise, um, not a lot. Um, you don't want to be pushed off of a bridge by a yak. There was, there's always that. I found, as a writer, as a travel writer, um, the biggest danger for me, and this might sound funny, was romanticizing Nepal and romanticizing Him the Himalayas. And it's really easy to do. Um, to actually, you're out there and uh, the people are so kind and uh, it's such extraordinary beauty. What I have to remember is that some of the people, a lot of the people up in the Himalayas are living in extreme poverty, or at least what we would consider extreme poverty. Not necessarily unhappy, uh, uh, but if any of them had the opportunity to jump out of McMansion suburbs of Boston, um, would they? You bet that they would. So my job, I felt, to bring this place um, to the reader was not to make it a utopia or a nirvana, but to bring out the real culture and the real people and the real human experience, not that from my point of view, but what they were experiencing. I did take notes while we were hiking. Um, I had to bring my notebook with me and uh, a notebook and a pencil, always a pencil, by the way, because you never know if the ink is gonna freeze. Um, the pens are notoriously un unpredictable um, when you're uh, out traveling. So I had uh, several pencils with me, and every evening, uh, what I tried to do um, was take copious notes. Um, this is what I saw, this is something that stood out for me. Um, this is something I wanna research more of when I get back. We also had a lot of photography equipment. I had a camera, a small camera, my wife had a small camera, and we had a large, good camera. And if I came across something, a plaque, um, a sign, um, some writing, you know, something that looked interesting, I would always take a picture of it. So that this way I could actually go back later um, when I was writing about that particular experience and I could, I'd, actually, I'd have an actual picture re record. And I also had uh, Mina which was, she was my interpreter, you know, which I had this huge advantage of being on the trail and being able to ask questions um, to the people at the tea houses or to the yak herders or to the porters or to the Sherpa. Um, so I was actually able to be a reporter in some cases on the trail because I had an interpreter with me. I think there's, there's three things actually that makes a good traveler um, in order to get the type of experience out of travel that leads to um, not just visiting the Eiffel Tower, not that there's anything wrong with that, but to bringing something back with you. One is you need to have an insatiable curiosity. Two is you need to be fearless. And the most important one is that you need to leave all of your prejudices behind. And if you can do those three things, um, you're going to get much more out of travel than a tourist experience. Um, there's nothing wrong with visiting the Eiffel Tower or visiting Big Ben or visiting the Liberty Bell. And in fact, if you go to those places, you should visit them. But if you want to learn about the people and the culture and the food, and if you want to get underneath everything that's presented uh, on the surface, um, you, you need to go in with no prejudices. And if you do that, you can come back with a lot more than what you went in with.